morning, everybody. Thank you for being here. My name is Konstantinos Filiotis. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm affiliated with Lawrence Berkeley National Lab in California and with KU Leuven Energyville in uh, Western Europe, in Belgium. So today's talk is going to be about um, a comparison, quantitative comparison, between DC and AC uh, nanogrid backbones for an office building that is located in this case study in uh, Belgium. Um, so just a few words about, I mentioned Energyville. So Energyville is the research institute, which is the result of a synergy between KU Leuven, the university in Belgium, and um, IMEC and VITO, which are national level research labs. And uh, one of the buildings that you see in the campus there in Hyang is being used in this case study to uh, provide us with uh, the basic uh, scenario. Um, so it seems that this question that the comparison between a DC and AC has been revisited lately. And the reason is that there is, especially on the context of zero energy buildings or sustainable buildings, self-sufficient buildings, whatever you prefer, uh, there is a lot of uh, penetration, and which is increasing, of uh, PV and also of batteries, electric vehicles, and DC loads in general. So there is also a lot of research work has been going on and with different results. Some of them, they have uh, highlighted that switching to a DC network for a building can give us an improved efficiency of about 20%. Uh, well, some other studies have been a bit more skeptical, saying that it might be a very good um, solution or direction for the future, but might not be the right um, decision right now. Of course, uh, all these studies are highly dependent on the different assumptions that they have been uh, considered. So speaking of assumptions for this case study, um, we assume, um, like I mentioned before, an office building that is located in Western Europe. So with whatever that means, the Western European conditions, weather conditions. Uh, it's a three office store, um, it's a three story office building, uh, which is used in our research group. And um, apart from that, I would like to mention that we also have more key performance indicators than most of the um, building energy simulation studies um, do. So apart from system level efficiency and losses, we also consider uh, other parameters like the self-sufficiency, the um, no grid interaction probability, and so on. But I'm going to go more detail to that. Uh, and instead of regular photovoltaics, we use the building integrate photovoltaics, which are vertically integrated, so on the facade of the building. So for that office building that we consider, uh, we populate the southern, eastern, and western facades with those BIPV modules. So basically, that's our methodology. We have our building. We have measurements, real measurements for, for the weather conditions and for the loads in that building. And we also compare the different topologies, the DC and AC. Uh, we use battery, and uh, all our models are developed in uh, Modelica, which is ideal for multi-physics simulations. I'm going to go into more detail about our models in a couple of slides. And um, from that, we uh, derive these key performance indicators by simulating over two periods. So basically, in all cases, we have uh, the grid backbone that I mentioned. And there, we connect uh, different, different things, which are, for example, the loads, uh, the building integrate photovoltaics, which produce our power, uh, the batteries. And we have a connection to the grid. This connection is, uh, is quite easily implemented. We assume that the grid can provide or absorb as much power as we need each time. And we also have, uh, of course, power electronic devices, um, which uh, connect all those different uh, blocks uh, to the grid backbone. So that being converters, inverters, rectifiers, and so on. So um, about our models, um, I'd like to start with the BIPV model, Building Integrated Photovoltaic. I'll repeat the acronym once again. So. Um, we use Modelica, like I said before, because all our models are uh, multi-physics models. That means, uh, for example, here, the BIPV has not only the electrical part of the model, but also a thermal one. Why? Because the BIPV module consists of uh, two things, like a PV surface and a glazing. In simple words, a window, a two-glass window. 
And behind the PV surface, there is a cavity which allows the natural ventilation of the PV module. So um, all these are modeled in the same uh, framework, in the same model, without the need of a, of a co-simulation. That's why it's really important to use some tool that allows for multi-physics uh, modeling and simulations. Um, another thing to mention here is that we made this model so that the, let's say, the resolution or the, the detail is adjustable. Uh, that means that the um, cavity uh, behind our PV surface can either be one single element with one value for uh, the mass flow rate and the temperature and so on, or it can be several elements so that we can have a, a detailed um, estimation like of the temperature gradient of our PV. Right. Uh, regarding power electronics, um, so in most building energy simulations uh, that, we, uh, that we see is that the uh, power electronics are considered to have a fixed efficiency. Uh, however, in this study we consider uh, the so-called efficiency curves. That means that the efficiency will depend on the actual loading uh, that we have on that power electronic uh, module uh, in relation, of course, to the, um, to the rating. So that means that if we have a, a grid inverter or a microconverter for PV that is underutilized, its efficiency is going to be lower than the rated one. And that has a significant impact on our overall results. Uh, so the data that has been used, uh, that's uh, something I would like to mention, um, is freely available online. So whoever wants to use them uh, for their own studies, you can find it in the references in those slides right after the, uh, the conference. Uh, and it's a research done, large-scale research done by the California Utility Commission. So about the battery, um, we use a model that uh, we have developed and it is also freely available online in the Open Ideas Library for uh, Modelica and we have developed that. It's again a synergy between um, Berkeley Lab and KU Leuven and other partners like the University of Aachen. Um, it allows us to have uh, let's say, a customized charging and discharging strategy. Uh, so what we have implemented in this study is that uh, simplistic strategy that when the PV generation exceeds the load, we charge the battery and the other way around. So now into our case study. So that's the building that we have used to perform that study. As you see, there are no BIPV there. So it's a theoretical hypothesis that we want to see how the BIPV would perform and the different topologies. However, uh, at the rooftop, this, this uh, so-called dummy house that we have at the roof, uh, we have reference cells and also a full meteorological station that uh, all the data that we measure that have, uh, they have been used in this study. Um, <coughs> And something more about uh, the specific case. So here, the BIPV module that we have, uh, the PV surface consists of a very typical 60-cell uh, crystalline silicon PV module uh, with a rated power of 244 watt peak. And the total frame of the BIPV has uh, about 3 meters uh, height. That's like 9 feet, more or less. I'm sorry for the metric units. And um, it's more or less the same as, as the, the roof uh, height of, uh, of a building minus some, some area for the slab and so on. Um, okay, so we used two periods to compare. Ideally, we should have an entire year, but um, since we use data that we measure ourselves and not some typical meteorological year data, um, yeah, it's, it's, it was a relatively new setup, so we used two different periods. We didn't have a complete um, year-long set yet. So we have a period in the winter and a period in the summer. And this is the plane of array radiance. Uh, like I mentioned before, we use um, the measurements for both south, west, and east, so all three. And the reason for that is not that in total we have more irradiance, but also we have a kind of a wider uh, window that can better serve our load. So uh, here are the three topologies that we have uh, used. So the DC and the AC. For the DC, as you see, there are two of them. So one with a higher voltage, 380, and the other one with 48. 
and uh, the AC, which use uh, typical, the typical European AC, 230 volts and 50 hertz. Um, and here you see the components I will just briefly mention for one of them. So we have the, these are the microconverters embedded to each of the PV modules. And we have a bidirectional converter for our battery. And then we have a converter for only the loads that are on a different voltage compared to the voltage of the backbone. So in the case of 380, it's for the 48 volt uh, loads and the other way around for the 48. For the case of AC, we use the rectifiers. Uh, just very briefly to mention that we have enough capacity for all our components to accommodate the maximum power flow that we have that is easily found uh, with the building energy simulations with uh, some trial and error approach. Apart from the PV where we use a 50% of the watt peak value. Why we do this? That's a very common thing to do in, in uh, Belgium. It's because of the partial loading and the lower efficiency at uh, low utilization rates that I mentioned earlier. So that's very common practice in Belgium. Uh, regarding the uh, key performance indicators that have been used for, for that study, um, we have the yield of the system, the system level efficiency, the efficiency on every component of the topology, and then of course self-sufficiency and self-consumption, also known as demand and supply cover factors. The load matching index, which is rather similar to the cover factors, but instead of energy it looks at the power matching, so we also see at the instant uh, matching of load and generate of uh, load and generation, and the no grid interaction probability, um, which is related again to the power matching. So how frequently can be really used um, this topology off grid? So non importing, but also not exporting power. Uh, so that brings us to the results. And uh, what we noticed here is that, of course, the picture is very different between winter and summer for those two periods. Uh, so we see that um, in the winter, uh, the AC topology is more efficient for this case study. And the reason is that uh, we rely so much on importing power from the grid in this case. And um, since we can connect directly to the transformer without the, the, the need to use the grid tie inverter, uh, it's less lossy and more efficient. Of course, that reverses in the summer where we have more production uh, from our BIPV plant. Uh, so efficiency improves marginally, however, but the big difference is in the uh, self-consumption uh, ratio. So that means that throughout the entire period, we can be much more self-consuming um, or let's say self-sufficient uh, compared to when using an AC topology. And that also is reflected in the uh, load matching index and the no grid interacting probability. So if we see here the losses, I don't know if the colors are, yeah. Yeah, so in this color, the green, this is supposed to be yellow, but. Uh, so in this green, we see the losses that occur in the grid inverter. So this is really significant. And even though the DC topology in the summer is kind of more efficient compared to AC, um, Still, it has a large part of losses that occur in the inverter and they could, I mean, if they could be reduced somehow or, yeah, then we would have a much uh, bigger impact, much bigger benefit from using DC. And we can see that in another slide here. So we take the 48 volt DC topology, which is the most efficient in the summer period. And we see that the median efficiencies are around 90% for the green grid inverter in the winter, but only 80% in the summer. And again, that brings us back to the, to the point where we have that um, uh, the underutilization of the grid inverter results into more losses and lower efficiency. So what is really a key here to make sure that we can make the most out of a DC topology like this is to make sure that we dimension that optimally and we uh, try to eliminate any instances of, uh, of partial loading. That brings us to the uh, conclusions that, okay, I mentioned that one that uh, we see that in the summer that the uh, 48 volt DC is more efficient slightly, uh, but it has a much bigger impact in terms of the self-sufficiency uh, metrics. 
we saw that the uh, grid inverter losses are really critical and they have been greatly influencing our total losses. We could have a much better result if we could somehow reduce these grid um, inverter losses. And dimensioning is really a key since the efficiency is also affected by uh, how well we have dimensioned that and how many occurrences of uh, partial loading we have. Uh, of course, as all works, this is a uh, work in progress, so we keep on working um, f further into this topic. Um, right now, we are working on optimization uh, using these underlying physical models developed in Modelica and try to optimize the rating for the grid inverter, like I mentioned before, that it is critical. Uh, we also go further into uh, the modeling of our losses. Um, because right now we have a measurement for all our loads, but we don't exactly know what part of this load is uh, DC low voltage, DC high voltage, and so on and so forth. So we go into greater detail into that as well. And the final thing, uh, we also look at the um, inverters or converters at the PV and perform a similar uh, parametric study, again, to determine uh, what the optimal rating is. and. Um, I can tell you already we have some result there. It's kind of less than 50% that has been assumed. And the reason is that this is for typical PV installations in Belgium. However, these BIPV modules are vertically integrated, so we have even lower um, filling factors. Anyway, um, then we will elaborate further uh, that paper. And if it's uh, invited for a manuscript, these uh, parts will be included. So thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I would like to thank, thank my colleagues from KU Leuven and, of course, European Union and the province of Limburg for financing that research. Thank you. So I have one. Um, how, I don't know if, what's your sense um, in terms of the scalability and conversion of existing building from AC to DC versus new buildings? kind of open that as part of the motivation. Any comments on that or thoughts on the ability to scale up your research in terms of? And so the question, if I understand correctly, is that if it's the same when we compare like an existing building to switch to DC rather than implementing it from scratch, right? Right, I assume it's more expensive to retrofit. Than yeah, indeed. Um, the thing is that I don't have specific data or I haven't performed some some form of this kind of uh, study and comparison. But of course, um, it's, it's very different. Um, it's going to be different cost because all the, the cables are different that they are used. And that means if we, if we have to implement this in an existing building, in terms of a retrofit, we will have to replace a huge part, probably the entire electrical installation. Uh, however, it depends on how it is implemented. Because if, um, for example, in an office building, these things are just located within a false ceiling. Right, so it's relatively easy to access that. So that's why we believe that it's better to look at office buildings because they are not only easier um, to just put the BIPV, but also in terms of retrofit, we can have an easier access to that. Uh, but I cannot comment on a specific uh, quantitative comparison of, in terms of the cost. Yeah. One go. Um, just two uh, slight technical questions. The first one is, um, so you shot this, uh, this loss chart, right? I wonder if there's any uh, implications on, on the losses, whether you have a DC voltage or an AC voltage, if your cables is quite long. I, I don't really know what the dimensions are here, like, you know, mm -hmm. how much, but, but maybe you could think about potentially bigger mini grids and whether they would kind of make a difference also, you know, in terms of losses, that's the first one. And the second one, um, if you think about, so, so my background is in, is in Africa, and they're actually putting DC mini grids into African villages where they actually put DC components. So it's, it's, you know, it's a quite different setting, but you don't have that inverter problem because you have like DC fridges, DC televisions and stuff. Would that, that would probably be a huge game changer also in terms of the DC favorability. Uh, yeah, so to the first uh, leg of the question, um, in this case, the cable losses are not considered. I, I would like to mention this, but in the expanded 
work that we have been doing, they have already been considered. Uh, the thing is that um, at the 380 volt DC, we saw that, of course, we have a bit less losses, which is expected because we have higher voltage and lower current. Uh, but compared to AC and the best DC, there is not a big difference, at least in terms of the share of the losses in the total um, picture of the losses. Um, so to the second part, um, I think that the, um, like the application of uh, DC grids is particularly important for places where we have eye landing or like small isolated grids like in Africa or other emerging economies. And um, I believe that if you don't have a connection to the grid, so if you don't need to, to connect to a transformer because in some cases it doesn't exist there, so you just only have DC generators and DC loads, then imagine that you don't have at all the grid inverter losses there. So basically you just have some, some DC to DC converter to probably bring your generator to the same voltage as the backbone and then directly to, yeah, and as long as you can dimension that uh, properly, it's gonna be much more efficient than a grid inverter What we see that it's like, when we have a lot of DC production, uh, you see it's only 80% and that's, that's a very big part of life.